time for your shit. In these videos, I rarely speak during cutscenes, and there are a lot of them in this episode, so well, there we have that. Please, let us through! <sighs> What are you? Cloud! Tifa! We have to get past! Whatever it takes! Right! I have a feeling that by this point in the game, most players or viewers will have some idea of what these specters are doing here. And the fact that I finished the game by this point, I can pretty much confirm that what I was thinking at the time was true, is. So, here we go. These specters seem to represent a kind of um, fandom of the original game, which want to see a remake. They definitely want to see the remake, but they don't want to see significant changes made to the story. Now, the fact that it is a remake, and it's a little bit weird... Uh, an awkward thing to go and remake the original game in a kind of shot-by-shot -shot sense. So, changes were going to happen. Fans were going to be against that. So, they added these things, which are sort of representative of the way the fans are. Every time that the characters, or, well, not every time, but in a number of incidences where the characters are going to do something which would deviate the story from what originally happened in the 1997 original, these specters appear in an attempt to push them back to prevent them from doing things. Now, for example, in the Sector 7 slums when we were uh, the second appearance of these specters, the story was playing out differently than it did in the original game. In the original game, Cloud was hired immediately to go on the second bombing mission. Well, in the remake, he wasn't. Barrett didn't want him there. Well, the Spectres appear. Jesse gets injured. Jesse can't be there. Well, somebody has to be there. Have to hire Cloud. The Spectres manipulated events so Cloud would go on the second bombing mission. And in this case, I think perhaps what they're here to do is to slow the characters down, because presumably if they got up the tower fast enough, they could prevent Shinra from blowing the pillar up. So, the specters appear, slow them down just enough to prevent too many things from changing. So in this way, these specters are kind of the pushback that fans would have trying to prevent the story from changing too significantly. It's a little bit of an awkward concept, and it will be not, like, outward, outright explained by characters later on in the game, but it'll become a little bit more clear later on. So we're just going to have to wait for that. 
I think maybe it might be just a little bit unevenly applied, though, if I were going to throw criticism at this, because the first appearance that we've seen of him was at uh, Cloud Stumbles Across Aerith in the Sector 2 plate. I don't know what, what sector that was. Where Cloud just comes across her and she's reacting to their presence and he can't see them. So I'm not sure what they were doing there. I'm not sure what change in history was going to occur in this ad scene. But they were there. I think Aerith has a specific special power in her ability to see them. And she seems to have some sort of precognitive ability to notice or to know what was going to happen in the future based on what happened in the original game. It's almost as if she played the original game. I think in the later games in this uh, remake series, we're going to find that there's some sort of underlying thing that the original game happened, and then something happened to sort of reset time. And it's playing out over again. Now, these specters are here to sort of keep it keep everything on rails, keep everything from changing too significantly, but they're going to fail, of course. And somehow, the previous events that were reset, Aerith and perhaps Sephiroth himself are aware of that somehow. There's too many! Aerith? Come on! I know it's being done for dramatic effect, but Midgar isn't really supposed to have night. I mean, those lights coming from the bottom of the plate are supposed to be on all the time. You got. Come on! <gasps> Shenra, they're trying to take out the pillar. I know. I have to go back. Barrett and the others are still... Stop. <sighs> Stay with Wedge. I'm going up. Sir, I'm going to. I can still fight. Biggs, he... They were shooting at me and he... Wedge, please. Let Cloud okay. handle it. Don't worry. I'll patch him up. Hang on, guys! Help is coming! Wedge, listen to me. You stay here with them. <laughs> About time you showed up, Mark. Still the show. <laughs> Biggs definitely gets kind of the short end of the stick when it comes to character development in a lot of ways here. The Avalanche characters, I mean, just is uh, secondary Avalanche characters in the original game were pretty simple characters. I mean, Wedge was fat, Jesse was the chick, and, and Biggs was... I don't know what the hell Biggs was supposed to be. But none of them were really important to the story. They were really just drawn into the whole avalanche thing. And they were in over their head and they ended up dying fairly early in the game. In this one, they put a lot more a lot more effort into fleshing these characters out. But I would have to say that Biggs got the short end of the stick. Now, as little of um, character development as Wedge gets, pretty much he's the fat funny guy. He does get a little bit more personality to him than you saw in the original game. 
Jassy definitely gets a lot more character development than the other two. Her attraction to Cloud, in a way, is is bolstered in this and more fleshed out and have a better understanding as to why she acts the way she does. And and uh, Wedge goes and makes some claims like, yeah, yeah, don't don't fall for it. It's all a game to her. I mean, she's an actress who's playing an act. She's presumably done this to a number of other people before. Biggs, on the other hand, has some secondary aspects of his character that aren't really seen in his presence. I mean, he's present in all of the scenes and some extra ones in this that he was in the original game. And then you hear some things about, Leah. he's um, sort of a benefactor of the orphanage over in Sector 6. Or 5. One of them sectors. <laughs> he's a benefactor of an orphanage, and he shows up there and he reads to the kids or some crap like that. But that's not something you ever see him do. It's all just sort of like informed character traits. When you see him, he in actually see him in the game, he's just sort of the sort of pseudo tough guy. He's a secondary character in the story and pretty much he seems to know it. He's not really the leading man. He's the secondary character. And even in the remake, with all the characters' stories sort of built up a bit, he still just comes across as the secondary character. He doesn't really matter too much to the story. He didn't get much of a treatment here. Biggs! You made it. No, I might not. Hey, is Wedge? Don't worry, he'll bounce back. That's good to hear. Could have used some extra padding myself. <coughs> <coughs> Don't talk. <coughs> it's pretty bad up there. <coughs> Cloud, promise me. <coughs> Don't let it be for nothing. Hmm. I won't. <coughs> You're a good man. <coughs> Giving me that... <coughs> One more thing. The Leaf House. It's an orphanage. In the Sector 5 slums. The kids. They're great. I used to visit. The... <coughs> that you'll have to do yourself. Let me guess. I'm not a fan of kids. No. But you have... So much in common. Good luck, Cloud. Our future is in your hands. more to this here than what happened in the original game, the reference to the orphanage and all of that, but it was more or less what happened in the original game. Biggs is encountered on the ascent up the pillar, has a few words to share with Cloud, and then is left behind, and then Biggs, of course, dies when the pillar collapses, just like uh, Wedge and Jesse do. So there's not really a big change there. I think something that should be noted here, and it's something that 
was mentioned in the original game, but they're putting a little bit more effort in making it obvious in this one. That Shinra is playing up this entire incident as though Avalanche were respond. Oh, I died. Huh. I don't remember that. It's playing up this entire incident as though the uh, collapse of the plate was the result of Avalanche's doing. And Avalanche went and blew up the plate. And Shinra's presence here was actually in an attempt to prevent them from doing it. Now, it's you got to pay a little bit more attention in the original game to like, news reports and all that kind of stuff to come to that conclusion. But the it was there. And here we're having it being mentioned by the guards that we stumble upon that they even seem to believe it. I'm guessing that Shinra plans on just uh, letting them die when the pillar collapses. Because, I mean... Perhaps they would be able to tell people, oh yeah, it was, uh, Marino blew this place up. <laughs> if they were allowed to escape. Of course, if there were no Shinra casualties, if all of their guards got out alive when the pillar collapsed, perhaps that would have a negative impact on people's perception of the events. Like, oh, well, you were supposed to protect them, and everybody, every, all of you, one of your people, got away. A bunch of them die. If a bunch of them die in the effect, in the attempt then it gives them a little bit more credibility. And it does seem to be, especially in this game, that Shinra is very much um, very much interested in maintaining a positive public image. Appearing as they're defending the people as being repressors and all that. Hmm. I wonder if that's really necessary, because they do seem to have the world under their thumb. But whatever. Testing. Testing. Attention, Avalanche Scum! We know all about your evil plans to destroy the pillar. But the Turks, uh, but Shinra. That's us. Won't let you get away with it. So go crawl back into whatever hole you crawled out of. Or something. That ought to do the right. Good enough. Wait, I know you. Mr. First Class. <laughs> First Class Asshole. Gotcha now! You ain't got nowhere to run! Throw down your weapon and surrender. Shinra does not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> Man, screw this cheap-ass play. Still alive and kicking? Damn right! Leading man sticks around to the credit roll! Though we gotta keep moving if we wanna make it that far. 